This is Ari Koretsky, and welcome to Jews You Should Know, introducing the broader community to interesting and inspiring Jewish men and women making a difference in our world. Some are already famous, some not yet so, but each is a Jew you should know. And we are back with another fabulous episode of Jews You Should Know. This week, a really, really inspiring guest and someone very appropriate for the season, at least those listening in real time here right before Yom Kippur, a time of change, of resetting our priorities and charting a new course for ourselves moving forward. Roy Neuberger is a person who did that and then some in his 30s, born to a legendary Wall Street investor, raised in the highly assimilated upper crust New York, but divorced from any Jewish background until decades into his life. Roy discovered his roots after years of existential turmoil and has since become a phenomenal ambassador of Jewish wisdom. Roy was also deeply connected to the famous Rebetzin Esther Jungreis, who in her own right was an extraordinary personality, a Holocaust survivor who later became one of the greatest and most widely acclaimed Jewish speakers, teachers, and a figure who helped thousands return to their heritage over the course of many decades. She has since passed on, but the Neuburgers and the Jungreises became family in a literal sense when their children married, as you'll hear in this interview. And her persona looms large over this entire story. Roy is a delightful speaker, a theatrical presenter, and I think that will come across quite clearly in our conversation. For the first time, I'm offering sponsorship opportunities. If anyone is interested in a sponsorship, please email jewsyoushouldknow at gmail.com or direct message us on Facebook or Instagram. And both of those venues, we are Jews You Should Know spelled out fully. On Twitter, it's Jews You Should Know with the letter U. As always, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening, whether that is Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, whatever platform it may be. Please do subscribe so that future episodes will come to your feed automatically and also spread the word to those who may appreciate hearing this podcast. And now for our conversation with inspirational personality and author Roy Neuberger. And we are here with Roy Neuberger, longtime Wall Street executive and an author, a Jewish inspirational figure of sorts. How are you, Roy? I am amazing. Thank you very much, Ari. I, I, could I, I have to make a slight correction Please. at the very outset. I am not a Wall Street executive. My father was a legendary Wall Street person. And he had, this will give you some idea of my background, the same first name as I have in English, Roy. He was Roy R. Newberger. I'm Roy S. Newberger. The middle initial tells a big story, by the way. But he was a Wall Street executive. I tried to be a Wall Street legend a few years ago, and I found out, no way. I don't have the genes. But, you know, that's a story in itself. But anyway, that's my father, not me. Okay, well, then let's take it from the top. Tell us a little bit about that early background, the S initial, and, uh, and, and your father, and, and where you're from. Okay, so it, it started, I, I, I want to tell you that I, I had the privilege so far of writing four books, having four books published. The first one is an autobiography, and um, um, uh, maybe we'll get to it. With God's help, a fifth book is coming out next spring after Pesach. But the first book is called From Central Park to Sinai, How I Found My Jewish Soul. And that is really describes where I grew up. Actually, my wife says I never grew up. And <laughs> which, of course, my wife is always right. And, um, uh, but I'm trying. I'm working on it. Anyway, so what does Central Park mean? That means Manhattan. 
New York, USA. I grew up on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, which is a ritzy area. When I grew up, when I was a kid, and it was a little while ago, it was a filled with Jews, very successful Jews in the material sense, but Jews in general who had rebelled against their past, and that was my upbringing. Uh, German assimilated Jews on the Upper East Side of New York uh, on Fifth Avenue, that's where I grew up, a very ritzy address. And I grew up to Jewish parents and no Jewishness at all. I mean, every Jewish boy has a bris, right? Every Jewish boy has a bar mitzvah, right? No bris, no bar mitzvah. I mean, it came later, but zero. My favorite day of the year was December 25th. We tried to be Americans and we were embarrassed to be Jews. And um, I grew up in this uh, rarefied atmosphere. I mean, among thousands of other kids who grew up the same way, Jewish kids. And I went to a very elite private schools and I had a wonderful family. Wonderful Which schools, by the way, did you go to? That's a whole story. We can spend a half hour on it. The ethical culture schools. Okay, let me tell you a little about this because it's a story. Ethical culture, the ethical culture society was founded in around 1875 by a German Jew named Felix Adler. You're shaking your head. You've heard this? You've no, heard but I, I get the, the type. Yeah, you get it. You get it. This was really the unspoken reason for the founding of this ethical culture society was really to try and schlep Jews away from Torah. It was part of this vast catastrophe called assimilation that began in Germany. Um, Felix Adler, the founder of the Ethical Culture Society, was born in Germany. Um, his father became the rabbi, I believe, of, the, of Temple Emanuel, the premier reform congregation on the Upper East Side of New York, which still stands today. But the son, for the son, that was too much, that was still too much Jewishness. And he founded this society, which really focused on ethics. They called it ethics. Humanism. Humanism, exactly. And you know, you found out it meant nothing. No ethics, no humanism, no nothing. There's, it was total emptiness. But when we were involved in it, my parents were involved in the Ethical Culture Society, very illustrious, wealthy families. It was a powerful movement then. They founded a school called the Ethical Culture Schools. I, my mother attended the Ethical Culture Schools. My father attended. And these were classy, high-level schools. One of the graduates of the Ethical Culture Society was J. Robert Oppenheimer, the founder of the, the, the creator of the atomic bomb, the head of the Manhattan Project during the Second World War. Brilliant, assimilated. It turns out, actually, believe it or not, he wasn't even Jewish. But in general, brilliant, assimilated, uh, wealthy Jews. And that's how I grew up. This is a very special family. My parents, very idealistic, very moral people, um, civic minded, three children, and I was a middle child. And the only thing is, I had a very sensitive neshama, sensitive soul, and I, I have this personality trait, which is, I can't lie to myself. I try sometimes, but I can't do it, it doesn't work. And I could not convince myself that I was happy. And I wasn't happy. I was miserable. At what age do you think you had that realization? At an amazingly early age. I'm talking literally, I couldn't articulate it. Six, seven, eight years old, nine years old. The symptom was, I was going to, the main symptom, I was scared stiff. I was scared. Like, what are you scared about? You're living in this protected environment. 
in a wonderful home physically i mean you know i i it was very protective we had we had no money problems a wonderful family what am i afraid of and I, it turns out in retrospect i can really describe it much better i was afraid of myself i was afraid that i was out of control i could not control myself and i was afraid i was going to do crazy things i was afraid of things that would happen to me it was all maybe irrational, whatever it is, but it, it was so overpowering that I could not get it out of my mind. I felt like my whole life is out of control. I couldn't breathe. I'm, I'm a young kid, what do you do? And it was scary. It was literally frightening, frightening. So I spoke to my mother about this. I wanna tell you a little about my father. Let's get that middle initial in. My father's middle name was Roy R. Newberger, Roy Rothschild Newberger. Later on, we found out he's a descendant of the famous Rothschild family. And my father was a genius in business. I don't use the word lightly. He was literally a genius in business. He began in Wall Street at the age of 26 in 1929, six months before the market crashed, huh. and it's amazing. I read a book by Winston Churchill who describes his, he was in New York when the market crashed in September, 1929. He was looking outside his hotel window and he saw bodies falling outside his window. People killed themselves in this crash. They lost everything in one day. My father was this genius, 26 years old. He saw it coming, he knew what to do, the financial, the technical terms are he hedged, he sold short, he, he just knew how to do it. And he, and he uh, became immediately successful on Wall Street to the point that today he, he passed away at the age of 107. 107? 107 and a half, sharp till the end. What year? When was that? 2010. Goodness. Was incredible, incredible person, but he be immediately became a success in Wall Street. And, 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 and that's a whole story in itself, which I, I could go into later because it's relevant. But let's stop there for, the, for my father. My mother, her middle initial was S, which I inherited. What was that for? That standard for that. The initial stands for Salant, Salant. My grandfather told me we come from a famous rabbi, Israel Salanter, who was one of the greatest rabbis of the 19th century and who founded the Musser movement. And my mother, just the way my father had the Rothschild personality genes, my mother had the Salant genes. So she was this assimilated Jew in New York City in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, but she was a salanter. She had this ethical personality, this Jewish ethical personality, and she was amazing. She never stopped working on herself. She was never good enough in her own eyes. She was kind to everybody. She had no airs. As they say in Yiddish, she had no shtick. She was an amazing person. So she was a very spiritual person and she could understand my spiritual anguish. So at that early age, I started looking, how can I deal with my life? Like, how do I get out of this prison of fear that I'm living in? This aimlessness, this rootlessness, I'm spinning through spiritual space and I have no anchor. I, 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 believe me, it was a very difficult childhood. So I started looking, how do I get out of this prison of my, my soul hurtling through space with no roots? And I started looking everywhere. First of all, so I told my mother, look, my mother, something's wrong with me. I need, I need to find something. So I went, she sent me to Sunday school. In America, they have something called Sunday school. What's Sunday school? In our case, my case, you know, a few hours a week on Sunday, you, you, we studied Catholicism 
Protestantism, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, Roman mythology, Greek mythology. One week we studied Judaism. Uh, did it help? It did not help. Why? Because it's all a theory. You know, they do this, they do this, they, but I really had to find, I had to be able to breathe. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't breathe. So I tried everything. I'll give you a quick tour of some of the places that I, I, I thought maybe the world's greatest authors, Shakespeare, Homer, Chaucer, maybe that's the answer. These guys were geniuses, world-class geniuses. Fine. So, you know, you study Hamlet, right? Shakespeare, a genius. He was a genius. This Jewish kid, Hamlet, I mean, it's brilliant, but can you live from Hamlet? Forget about it. Doesn't work. No good. I thought maybe uh, I'll go out nature. That's the answer, nature. I mean, society is so corrupt. You know, you go out, you start hiking, you see a tree. Oh, it's so beautiful. Ah, oh, I feel better already. You see a mountain. Ah, oh, beautiful. So I got into nature very much. I'm not going to go through the whole story because that's all. Everything has a story, but I hiked all around, you name it, everywhere, east, west, north, south. And, 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 and but it didn't work. It didn't work. I mean, it wasn't enough. Uh, high school, I'm going to make a statement here. This is not a political statement. In high school, so we, it was a time of the beginning of um, the civil rights movement. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And we would picket, demonstrate outside stores that were accused of racial discrimination. This is not a social statement or a political statement, but this Jewish kid, he's demonstrating outside Woolworths and it didn't fill up my soul. It just wasn't enough. At college, it was the uh, Vietnam War. We were in the peace movement and we thought we're going to fix the world, bring peace to the world. And again, I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm making no political statement. All I'm saying is this Jewish kid, it didn't fill up the emptiness inside. I had to keep looking. This is only a sampling of the thousands of things that I tried. So I'm in high school in this very ritzy elite private school, which is part of the ethical culture schools. It's called Fieldston School, which is the high school of the ethical culture schools in a very ritzy neighborhood in Riverdale, New York. And something unbelievable happened. So what happened? I mean, of course, I didn't believe in God. I mean, that's the biggest joke in the world. Like, are you give, me, give me a break, God. I mean, I mean, but what happened is, <laughs> which happens really to so many of us, Hashem, God, believes in us. We may not believe in him, but he believes in us. I'm in high school, and because I'm such a nutcase, that's what I thought, I'm afraid to talk to girls. And this girl came to the Fieldston School, her name is Linda Valenci. I want to tell you, Linda Valenci was Miss Universe. And I'm not exaggerating. I could bring proofs to this. <laughs> <laughs> Whole school stopped when she arrived. <laughs> Linda Valenci was, you know, Miss Universe. I'm never in a million years going to talk to Linda Valenci because I'm this nutcase and I'm afraid to talk. I mean, what can I do? But, you know, God runs the universe. You get the biggest surprises in life. So there's an amazing story in the Torah about Bilaam, the non-Jewish prophet, who hated the Jews. He tried to curse the Jews. And Bilaam had a donkey. And Bilaam's donkey could talk. It turned out Bilaam's donkey really was smarter than Bilaam in the long run. And if Billum had listened to his donkey, he would have been better off. Anyway, I mean, the, the, the Torah tells us that donkeys can talk. And it happens once in the history of the world. So one day, 
I'm at a track meet at the Fieldston School. And I look around to my right. And I'm sitting next to Linda Valencia. I mean, I froze. I became a block of ice. I turned to stone. Like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And then, this is not an exaggeration. God opened the donkey's mouth. And I started to speak. I'm the donkey. And I'm speaking to Linda Valencia. Like normal words, human words. I, the donkey, started talking to Linda Valencia. And we had a normal human conversation. So, you know, what do you do? I asked her out. And we started going out. And <laughs> we didn't stop. And I, I, like, nobody in the school can believe it. Like, what? Linda Valencia is going out with him? Like, what's the world coming to? They still can't believe it. Anyway, after high school, I went to the University of Michigan. And for some crazy reason, Linda Valencia followed me a year later. And for some crazy reason, after my second year, her first year at Michigan, she married me. I mean, don't ask. I, it, it's all a miracle. From top to bottom, it's millions and zillions of miracles. And actually, I mean, we're still married. And I believe it or not, and it's a long time. But I want to tell you something amazing. It's not like they lived happily ever after, because life just doesn't work that way. I mean, that's a fairy tale. We don't live in a fairy tale. After we'd been married two and a half years, we were still students at the University of Michigan, and the whole marriage started blowing up. Because, I'll tell you, it says in the Torah, a famous story in the Torah, it's not a story, an explanation, that husband and wife, Ish and Isha, man and woman, Ish, the Hebrew word Ish has a letter Yud, and the Hebrew word Isha has a letter He. Ish is a man, Isha is a woman, and the Yud and He from their names form the name of God, meaning man, woman, and God. That's an ideal marriage. If you have God in your home, you have a chance, maybe you can make it. Marriage is not simple. If you take the letter Yud out of Ish and the letter He out of Isha, you get Ish, fire. Take God out of your marriage, fire. That's what happened with us. The marriage went on fire. A fight, an argument, a disagreement, a little fire begins. It burns out of control. You don't have God there to put out the fire for you. Burns out of control. And that's what happened. I'll never forget this moment. On January 10th, 1966, at 2 a.m., it was a Monday morning. I woke up in the middle of the night. I'm crying. Monday morning, but 2 a.m., I'm crying. It's all over. My life is blowing up. My life is blowing up. The marriage is blowing up. Everything is blowing up. It's all exploding. I'm crying. I tried everything. I thought to myself, my life is this long corridor. There are hundreds of doors off the corridor. I opened every door and every door leads nowhere. I tried everything. It's all over, finished. I'm, I, I, no hope. And then, I got a crazy, insane thought, a crazy thought. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Could there be a God? Oh no, God, what? No, it can't be God, that's insane. I mean, if you were, uh, you know, a monk living in the dark ages, oh, you believed in God, you didn't know it, you couldn't read or write. Me, I'm the sophisticated university student, University of Michigan, I should believe in God? That's insane. And then I realized, if your life is falling apart, you need God. God, help me. If you're there, help me. And everything turned around. For the first time in my life, I could breathe. I had hope. Everything. Wow.
Maybe God is real. Maybe God is real. Wow. But I still didn't want to admit I was a Jew. I didn't want to admit I was a Jew. So that's when I started getting into Hinduism. We had a professor from India. Hinduism, Buddhism. A few years later, we went to study in Oxford, England. I was studying at Balliol College, Oxford. We went all around the continent, Rome, Paris, London, the Vatican, cathedrals, frescoes. Oh, Christianity, that's it. That's so obvious. That's the answer. And I wrote a book, Why the Jews Are Wrong and the Christians Are Right. I mean, brilliant. You should know, Ari, I still have a, one copy of that book in my files. Rebetzin Young Rice years later told me, Yisrael, you have to keep one copy of this book because someday you're going to say, you know, I'm this holy Jew. I would never have done something like that. So you have to remember where you came from. Keep one copy of, of this book, which is total baloney. Not one word makes any sense, but what do we do? What do we do? Okay, there's an amazing thing that happened a few years later. I don't want to be a Jew. I believe in God, but I don't want to be a Jew. We moved back to New York from England. We settled in the Hudson Valley, 60 miles north of New York City, near West Point, a beautiful community. And I had to have something to do with my life. What was, what was your plan? Did you expect to go into Wall Street or did you want to just kind of live off the largesse of your family trust? Very good question. I really wanted to do something good in the world. I had no clue what I wanted to do. I knew I liked to write. I was creative. At that point, I had no desire to go into Wall Street at all. So we settled in this community and there was an, an old newspaper for sale a weekly newspaper, a local newspaper. My parents helped me. We bought the newspaper. I became the publisher of this. You wanna know how small this newspaper is? This newspaper still exists today. 3,200 circulation, like nobody. But it was, it was a very nice newspaper. So I wanted to make it a great newspaper. And there was an organization which still exists to this day. Every profession has its organization. The National Newspaper Association, the Association of Weekly Newspapers in the United States. At that time, we're talking, when was this, 19, 1970, approximately. The head of this organization was a brilliant guy, a Jewish guy, an amazing guy, named Walter Grunfeld. Walter Grunfeld came from a famous German Jewish family. His uncle was Dayan Grunfeld, the head of the rabbinical court of London, a very famous person. He and his family, Walter came over from Germany before the war. They were lucky to escape the war. And Walter had three newspapers in Binghamton, New York, and he was the head of the National Newspaper Association. And he was brilliant. And I used to love to listen to him speak. So one day I called him, Walter, Walter, we have to come visit you so we can find out how to make a great newspaper. Can we come to spend the day with you? Sure, of course. My wife and I drove to Binghamton, New York from Cornwall on Hudson. We spent the day with Walter. At the end of the day, it was time to go home. We stopped at his house for coffee. It was 6.30 p.m. Walter wanted to watch the news on TV. He turns on the news. He's standing in front of the TV and he's crying. What's going on? It was October 1973, Yom Kippur War. And Walter Grunfeld is standing and crying in front of the TV. I can't believe it. A week ago, Israel was finished. It was all over. Look at this. General Sharon just crossed the Suez Canal. He's got the Egyptian army surrounded. They're marching on Damascus. Israel saved and he's crying with happiness. And I'm like, uh, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're talking about. I saw it in the paper. They have a war in the Middle East somewhere. Yeah, right, I know about it. And Walter Grunfeld 
looks at me and starts screaming. What kind of a Jew are you? What are you made of stone? Don't you have a heart? What kind of a Jew are you? What kind of a Jew am I? I, I don't know. Nobody ever asked me that before. And I started thinking. I tried everything in life, everything, nothing left out. There's only one thing I know zero about, nothing. Being a Jew, well, oh man, maybe I gotta check into this. We had two children then, two girls, one five and one three. The five-year-old kept asking us questions. All her non-Jewish friends, because that's all she had, kept asking her about God, talking about God. She didn't know anything about God. How do we answer our children? Six months later, I was having lunch with one of the advertisers on my paper, a wonderful Jewish man who had a hardware store in our town. I said to him, you know, I mean, I was never in a synagogue in my life. I'm 31 years old. I mean, what do you do there anyway? You want to come sometime? He said, you want to come sometime? Yeah, yeah, sure, we'll check it out. So he calls me that night. We have this speaker coming Thursday night. This woman evangelist, a Rebbitson. What's a Rebbitson? Just come, you'll check it out. Okay. And that is how we met the famous Rebbitson Esther Young Rice, 31 years old. What did she say? Very simple. You are a Jew. We stood at Mount Sinai. God gave us a Torah. We're descended from kings and prophets. We gave morality to the world. Do not kill, do not steal. We taught the world there's a God. Whoa, is this for real? I never heard this stuff before. My wife and I were so awestruck we couldn't even speak to rabbits and young rice, but the next morning I woke up, you know, the next morning you, you sleep on it. Wow. Rebbitson, I wrote to her, Rebbitson, if this is true, what you said last night, I mean, like, is there some kind of follow up to this? She wrote back, yeah, you have to learn Torah. Come to my classes in Brooklyn. This was the beginning of her movement in 1974. We started driving to Brooklyn. After the Yom Kippur War, you couldn't get gas. It was rationed. Just a little each week, every other day. And besides that, Tuesday night when she gave the classes, that was the night I put my newspaper to bed. I had to spend the whole night putting my newspaper together. Forget about it. Gas, newspaper. We got to live. We have to find out what this is all about. We started driving every Tuesday night to Brooklyn, to her classes. These classes became our whole week revolved around them. And then Rebbitton Young Rice got a call from Israel, from the Israel Defense Forces, the, the army. Rebbitton, we want you to come and speak to the soldiers. First she said, no, no, I can't. Say, somebody told her, you talk to the soldiers about Hashem, about God, they're gonna throw tomatoes at you. But the army kept calling, Rebbitton, please come. Okay, she finally agreed. And she took a small group. We never wanted to go to Israel. We thought the Jews stole it from the Arabs. I mean, you know. But all of a sudden, we were learning Torah. We found out, oh, that's our land. God gave it to us. All of a sudden, we wanted to go to Israel. So we signed up to go with the Rebbitson. This was the spring of 1974. We get on the plane. El Al. It's midnight. We're wiped out. We go to sleep at four in the morning. It's getting light outside the plane. And these guys are getting up and they're putting boxes on their heads. Oh man. Talis and Twillin. The first time in my life I ever saw Talis and Twillin was on El Al when I was 31 years old. We landed in Israel. The first Shabbos of our life was a kibbutz lavi in the Galil. We thought we're in heaven. I never had a moment's peace in my life. 
all those years in the peace movement, there was never any peace. All of a sudden, Shabbos, we had peace. We spent two weeks in Israel, came back to America. When we got to the airport, the Rebbitson's father was waiting for us. A man with a long black beard, a black hat. We went back to Cornwall in Hudson, New York. My wife and I looked at each other. No way. We're out of here. There's nothing here for us anymore. We sold the newspaper. We sold our home. We moved in to Rebbitson Young Rice's neighborhood in Long Island, where her husband was the rabbi, North Woodmere, New York, two weeks before Rosh Hashanah. And a whole new life began. Instead of going to the Catholic school in Newburgh, New York, our five-year-old daughter was enrolled in Torah Academy for Girls in Far Rockaway, New York. And everything began. We, we were in nursery school at the age of 30 and 31. We had to learn Aleph base like little kids. I had to have a bris. I had to have a bar mitzvah. I had to learn like a little kid. But that's how it began. What did you decide you were going to do at that point professionally? And, and how did your parents react to all this? Oh, two big questions. Professionally, right away, I stayed in the newspaper business. I was lucky enough. I sold the new, our newspaper. I became an editor in a major New York newspaper, the uh, Long Island Press. And so that paper went out of business. Then I did many other things in my life. I, I, I became uh, uh, the principal of the Young Rice's Yeshiva in Brooklyn, after the English principal, the general studies principal, the administrator. Then I did go into Wall Street for um, uh, uh, 10 years, and I found out I am no man. I am not my father. I was no good in Wall Street. And when I finally got out of Wall Street, in the year 2000, I, what am I going to do with my life? And that's when I said, you know what? Let me try writing this book I always wanted to write. And that's when I wrote this book from Central Park to Sinai, How I Found My Jewish Soul. How did my parents react? Our parents react. First, they thought we were crazy. They thought we were crazy. And we thought we were crazy also, but we did it. We're doing it. And then the more they saw how normal this life is. And then when the grandchildren came, and the grandchildren are so wonderful to them, and so beautiful, and so polite, and they began to have what we call Yiddish anachas. And we went out of our way, Rebbe Young Rice taught us, there's a mitzvah, honor your father and mother, keep it out of aim. So we became closer and closer to our parents. And as time went on, our relationship became closer and closer and closer. I will tell you an amazing story. My mother, who had this very deep Jewish soul, I don't think she was ever herself really happy until we became religious. And she had such happiness from us when she was in her early 70s, our daughter, her granddaughter, was in seminary in Jerusalem, in Yerushalayim. We decided to visit our daughter for Passover in Jerusalem. So we went, our whole family, and we, I asked my mother if she wanted to come. And she came with us. Age of, say, 72, my mother had the first Passover of her life in Jerusalem her first trip to Israel. She toured around Israel with us, and we had an amazing, beautiful time. It was unbelievable. The same thing happened with my wife's parents. My wife's mother, who never kept Shabbos in her life, the last eight years of her life, she spent every Shabbos with us, my wife's mother. And she, her whole life, was her grandchildren. Our parents had happiness through our family. It was unbelievable, amazing. We never pushed. I never told my parents what to do, but they just 
They loved it and they saw it's so normal. It's so right. It was incredible. I could go on and on, but you know, whatever. <laughs> That's it. Do you feel like your decision made ripples in your father's Wall Street elite enclave? I want to tell you, you know, when you're successful, it's very hard to change your life. My father was surrounded by very successful people. But I want to tell you, they all respect us. And uh, my father himself, his own life was changed dramatically by what happened with us. My parents, as happens in very many families in American Jewish family, my grandparents were cremated in America by their own choice. My parents were planning to be, they, in their wills, they had it written they were going to be cremated. But Jewish burial does not, uh, you're not supposed to be cremated if you're a Jew. And I asked my mother, after we became religious, mother, would you change your will? I asked her. She agreed immediately. She went and changed her will. My father changed his will. My parents had Jewish burial. My wife's parents had Jewish burial. It's unbelievable. On my mother's first yard site, the first anniversary of her death, I went to the cemetery to her grave. I was the only member of the family who went there. And when I left, I said, God, I want to ask you a favor. Mother, I believe, is in the world of truth with you. And I mean, if she is, she had Jewish burial, she's changed her life in so many ways, not because I pushed her, but because she wanted to. God, you think I could get like a little information what's going on up there with my mother? Like, you know, a little message up from up there. Thank you, God. And I left the cemetery. I didn't say a word to anybody about this. The next morning, I woke up. My daughter, who was 18 years old at the time, said to me, Abba, I want to tell you, I had a dream last night. Grandma came to me in my dream, and she was so happy. I got my answer the next morning. God answered me. My mother was so happy in the world of truth. There are millions of stories. Amazing. I know that your family became very uh, intermingled with the family of Rebbitz and Young Rice. Can you talk a little bit about that and about her movement and, and what she meant in your yep. life? Yep. So Rebbitz and Young Rice, we moved to her community. We became like one family. We became the Shabbos destination for people who heard her speak every Tuesday night in Manhattan at these huge, she would speak to a thousand people on Tuesday night. There was nothing like it. And then my wife would get up after the Rebbitson and invite people for Shabbos. Nobody could believe it. What, you're inviting people you don't even know? And people came to us every week. So we became like one family with the Young Rice family. And Rebbitson Young Rice decided that she would like our second daughter, Yaf, our first daughter moved to Israel. She's living there to this day. Our second daughter, Yaffa, and the Rebbitson thought Yaffa is perfect for her younger son, Rabbi Usher Anshul Halevi Young Rice. And they got married. And so we became really one family. And our daughter, Yaffa, is married to Rebbitson Young Rice's son, Rabbi Usher, and then, thank God, we had also three more children after that. We had Miriam, Miriam Basia, who had, she's the one who had the dream about my mother, and Aaron Yaakov, our son, and our d daughter, Nahama Bracha. So we, the, the Rebbitson, the Rebbitson was a legend. I mean, her whole life was bringing back Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, to Hashem, to God. Her whole 
idea in life was to carry on the Jewish greatness of Europe that she grew up with to America and try to transform this spiritual wasteland where so many Jews were getting lost into a place where Jews could come home. When she started her movement, today Jewish outreach movements everywhere you could look. In the 1970s, when she began, there were only a few people. It was courageous to begin this. There was Rabbi Shlomo Kalbach, there was Yeshiva Shayashiv, there was Chabad, there was Or Sameach. If I am, am leaving anyone out, please forgive me. But there were just a handful of organizations. And Rebbets and Young Rice, had, it, had, it was enormous courage when she rented Madison Square Garden. And she put on this program, You Are a Jew. And she brought thousands of people back. And over her lifetime, not thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, she made a revolution. And it took huge courage. But she wanted to work for God. And, 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 and she did. And she was incredibly successful. I know that your first book was an autobiography of sorts or a memoir. Tell me about some of the other books. You said you've written four and a fifth on the way. So tell me right. about those other projects. This is the second book, World Storm, Finding Meaning and Direction Amidst Today's World Crisis. This is a spiritual history of the world from the Garden of Eden to the present. The third book, 2020 Vision. I must tell you from my heart, my two favorites are the first one from Central Park to Sinai and this one, 2020 Vision. This is a novel, but it's a true novel. This is not fooling around. This starts with a terrorist attack on America. It's called 2020 Vision. It takes place in the year 2020. And I guess I don't have to remind anybody, we're almost there. A massive terrorist attack on America. A group of Jews is trying to escape to a place of safety. And it ends, without going into details, it ends with Shofar, Gadol the Great Shofar. It ends with the coming of Mashiach in Jerusalem. It's an amazing story. And it is written in a very realistic way. And it's full of hope because all Jews are filled with hope. Okay, the fourth book is called Working Toward Mashiach. This is actually a collection of my weekly columns in the Yad Ted Neman newspaper. I've had a column, a weekly column in that newspaper for 10 years. And this is a collection of those weekly columns. And I'll just tell you briefly, there is a fifth book coming with God's help next spring, published by a wonderful publisher called Mosaica Press. And this book is basically called Surviving the Days Before Mashiach. We're living in a very rough world today. Do I have to tell anybody? Everybody knows. A very rough world. There are challenges everywhere you look. Every day brings a new crazy story, crazy challenge. Life is getting very chaotic, wacky, dangerous, frightening. And the amazing thing is our rabbis in the Talmud told us this is exactly how it's going to be in the days before Mashiach. And if we hang on for a little while longer, we're all going to get there to see it. Those amazingly brilliant days. Just like the days in biblical Egypt when everything was falling apart, but there was someone named Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, and whoever followed Moshe Rabbeinu out of Egypt got to meet God at Mount Sinai. That's what the fifth book is about. It's a kind of a handbook. What's your favorite book? I'm going to say three. That's such a tough <laughs> question. Ari, it's not a fair question. On certain days, Central Park to Sinai. On certain days, 2020 Vision. But the last one, which is really called Hold On, Surviving the Days Before Mashiach, 
On Certain Days, that's my favorite book. I am very excited about that book, and I think it's going to be something great. You know, we all need to help each other to give each other through all these, all these difficult days and see the very happy, amazing days which are coming very soon. Other than writing, are there any other projects you're involved with today? And Yeah, my wife and I speak all over the world. We actually have spoken since my first book came out. My wife and I have spoken in 15 countries, in hundreds of locations, and we, we tell our story a lot. It's amazing because both of, we go on a college campus and these kids see this husband and wife and we've been married quite a few years, thank God. And they say like, oh, I don't believe this. Like they're still talking to each other and like they have this whole story together. They have this whole life together and they tell like they do the end of the year report like, you know, those new burgers, I, I want to have a marriage like that. Just the fact that they see a husband and a wife speaking together and, and, and going through life together, that in itself is an inspiration to people. So really, what do we do? That's what we do. The writing and the speaking, we go all over the place speaking. And you know something? You walk into a room full of strangers, an hour later, you're all family, you know, and you know, like people are hugging you and they, we're giving strength to each other. And that's what we have to do to get the, through the days before Mashiach. Roy Newberger, it's a really inspirational story from Central Park to Sinai. Really appreciate you sharing your story with us. I encourage people to read the full version in the book, as well as the other books, which are real sources of spiritual inspiration. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Ari, it was an honor and a pleasure to be here. Thank you. This has been Ari Koretsky on Jews You Should Know. Please visit us at JewsYouShouldKnow.com and subscribe at iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you consume podcasts. Find us on social media at Jews You Should Know. If you'd like to become a supporter of this podcast, we would greatly appreciate that. And you can do so by visiting Patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash Jews You Should Know. Finally, if you have enjoyed this podcast, please leave us a review so that we can continue to grow and introduce many more people to Jews you should know.